Um, let me introduce two people who will do a kind of a tag team on section two of our activity. Section two was asking the question, what is it that we're trying to protect and why? And to lead sort of a discussion of a review of the papers and ideas in that area, we have Peter Kariva and Shahid Naim. Peter is, you, many of you know, is senior scientist at the Nature Conservancy now, and he's actually the lead scientist for the Pacific Western region. He's also an adjunct professor at the Bren School, and he has a long and distinguished academic career that includes posts at Brown University, University of Virginia, University of Washington, Santa Clara University. A very distinguished research and teaching career in conservation biology and ecology. And he's also, in, as part of this activity, he's worked on uh, questions about the NGO's role in filling in the gaps in the Endangered Species Act. One other hat that he's worn in his career was actually with NOAA as the director of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center Biological Division, the director of that division. So Peter is going to start on this presentation, and let me tell you a little bit about Shahid as well. Uh, Shahid is a professor of ecology and environmental biology, I don't know if I got all of the terms right, but at Columbia University. And he's widely recognized and cited for his research on the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem function. Uh, before coming to Columbia, he held a faculty position at the University of Minnesota and another at the University of Washington. And he generously contributed to this effort as well over the last year, produced two papers, co-authored. Uh, the first one entitled The Endangered Species Act and the Preservation of Ecosystem Functioning and Ecosystem Services. And the second paper was entitled A Theoretical View of What It Means to Preserve Nature and Natural Processes. So if you haven't had an opportunity to read those, they're quite interesting and provocative papers that are online. So without further ado, Peter, Shahid, the floor is yours. Okay, today, um Shahid and I are going to talk about what are we trying to protect. That's the section of the book that uh, we're contributing to. And it might seem like it's an arcane and academic question, and especially when you read the chapters and uh, read how many different scientists and academics spend their time defining biodiversity and defining protect. My job is to set the stage for Shahid, is going to summarize the chapters. And by setting the stage, I want to state some questions that indicate why this is a practical issue. The first point is, is nowadays we talk about protecting biodiversity. Uh, when the Endangered Species Act was first signed, biodiversity wasn't really even a word in our vocabulary. But we have the sense that we're out there to protect biodiversity. That's not that easy to define. There's a lot of different definitions of biodiversity, and which definition you pick determines what actions you take. Similarly, the word protect, which seems like such a simple word, is not that easy. Uh, one person's protection might be a few animals in a zoo, and another person's protection might be several million bison uh, roaming the plains. And what we have done, I think, is we've fallen into definitions of biodiversity and protection almost accidentally that then dictate our policy. And I want to give you some statistics and stories to indicate why this rather academic discussion is actually worth having for practical reasons. Oops. First of all, I'll say we're not trying to protect all of biodiversity, even though we say we are. Um, instead, we show favorites. And by showing favorites, we're, we're spending more money, more energy, more effort protecting some things while others are neglected. Some very dramatic examples are, in the United States alone, there are 57 nonprofit organizations, NGOs, whose sole purpose is to protect birds. Meanwhile, there's only four whose purpose is to protect invertebrates of any kind. Um, that's quite bizarre given the distribution of diversity in the United States. Less than 1% of the species in the U.S. are birds. Yet we have all these NGOs for them. Meanwhile, over three quarters, actually 84% of the, of the species in the U.S. are invertebrates. We have very little, very few NGOs dedicated to them. So clearly we're not just trying to protect biodiversity. We're trying to protect birds to a large extent. And that's well, you know, it's, it's, many people have shown pie charts like this. It's hard to, to read this pie chart because the print's so small. But I could just draw attention to a couple of aspects of it. This pie chart represents what species, um, the composition of all the species in the U.S. by group. And this big, huge chunk that sort of looks like Pac-Man here is invertebrates. It's 84%. 
Yet if you looked at the Endangered Species Act and asked, what's the section of the pie that represents invertebrates that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, it's this tiny little slice of the pie, 14%. So again, favorites and things that we neglect, invertebrates. There's another way of looking at it. It's not just what's listed, it's how we spend our money. Um, these data are available for every year. I just happened to find this table this morning. It was the easiest to decipher and, and interpret, though I intend to do it for all years. But if you track the federal and state expenditure, so how much money we spend, in this case at fiscal year 1994, on different species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, you find that over half of the money, over the half of the money goes to just five species. Remember, there's over a thousand species listed. Five species get over half the money. Two fish, two salmon, and three birds, spotted owls, gnat catcher, and red cockaded woodpecker. Five species get over half of all the money states and the federal government spend on endangered species protection. Meanwhile, at the sort of bottom of the list, these are the favorites. These five species are our favorites. They're not all about biodiversity. We're spending 50% of our budget on five species, not all about biodiversity. At the bottom of the list, we have almost 400 species that if you add them all up together, those 400 species total get less than 1% of the expenditures. So again, real favoritism here and real neglect here. Um, you could look at, it's, it's, it's unfair, I work for the Nature Conservancy, it's unfair just to pick on the federal government. It's interesting to ask the, uh, an organization like the Nature Conservancy how it spends its money. Again, the Nature Conservancy's mission is to protect all of the world's biodiversity. That's what it says. But let's look at the geography of how it actually spends money and do it just in the United States, since that's where the Endangered Species Act plays out. Um, California here is by far the richest state uh, in terms of spending money on conservation projects, $15 million annually. But does these, the real question is, how does this expenditure match up with need? An uh, analogy I like to use to think about this question is, we frequently talk about how many dollars do you spend per school child in different school districts. And if the discrepancy between poor and rich is on the order of two or three, we get very, very upset that there's just too much money going to the rich districts and the poor are suffering too much. So let's look at it by states, the geography of how we're protecting biodiversity. And um, these are very hard to read, but the vertical axis, the height of these, represents expenditures. It's millions of dollars per species at risk, per listed species. And this is um, millions of dollars per endemic species, in other words, per species that live only in that particular state. And this single point from this, these, each bar is a different state, is the huge difference in height. New York State is spending over 40 times more money per species at risk than Alaska way down at the bottom. And it's interesting, California, which is often thought as being so wealthy in terms of conservation, having so conservation dollars, is still in the bottom half because there are so many species at risk in California. Um, California really isn't that affluent. Again, it's, think of it as like dollars per school child. So there's a incredible discrepancy geographically in how we're protecting our biodiversity and how we invest. The second stack of this, again, so what are we trying to protect? You know, we're trying to protect biodiversity and so far I've, I've, I've pointed out that we have real favorites. You know, we, we really aren't trying to protect all biodiversity. Just by cultural and a lot of different reasons, some groups are favored over others. How about this word protect? Protecting goals have different meanings to different groups. Um, in a paper that's uh, uh, contributed to this book, Bill Rogers has a wonderful paper about Native American goals for bison and wolves, and the Native American groups would really like to recover bisons and wolves to very much their, their um, condition 200 years ago. No federal agency comes even within 1% of that in its goals. No nonprofit organization even seeks that. But it draws attention to this word protect means different things to different groups. Again, um, it's interesting to contrast a nonprofit like the Nature Conservancy, whose mission is to protect all biodiversity, to federal system whose mission is to protect these listed species. What are the goals? 
Many people have complained that the goals set by the federal government are too low. Let's see how they compare to the Nature Conservancy's goals. This takes a lot of work to do, but was able to find seven species for which the Nature Conservancy has set precise quantitative goals about what it defines as conservation success. A part of the way the Conservancy does its work is it develops these, these plans, conservation plans. Part of that planning process is to define quantitatively for different species in different habitats how much you need. Part of the federal government's uh, approach is to define quantitatively how much you need for recovery. And for these seven species, you can contrast them. Same species, same region, same science. They're both using very good science. In fact, if you looked at the references they cited, they cite the same papers, the same experts, but different numbers. Uh, this muscle here, wedge muscle, Nature Conservancy wants 35 populations for conservation success. The federal government wants only 10. Lake-sized daisy, a small, pretty, endangered flower. Nature Conservancy wants 17 populations for conservation success, and it wouldn't consider it done its job until it had gotten 17 protected. The federal government would be satisfied with four. So again, this draws attention to this word protect. Um, can have very different meanings to agencies, NGOs, group like the Native Americans, and what you define as protect obviously then has profound practical implications. It's going to take a lot more land protection to get these 35 than it is those 10 and a lot more work and investment. So I want to wrap up before I turn it over to Shahid Neem by asking a question, is there anything useful here? What I've been trying to say is that the notion of what we are trying to protect, both in terms of what we define as needing our attention and what we define as satisfying protection has real practical implications. And we're missing, we're not thinking about it. We're not being strategic. We're, we're making these definitions and setting these goals or definitions of success uh, in a rather ad hoc way. We could be much more strategic. We could allocate our, do our, our dollars, instead of all the Nature Conservancy dollars, a bulk of them going to New York and so few going to Alaska, you could imagine alternative schemes. You could allocate dollars uh, for recovery, for endangered species, where you wouldn't give money dollars if you thought it was a lost cause, a triage approach, and where perhaps you give a lot of dollars if you thought the money could give you a good return. That would be a strategy. But we don't have a strategy. Goals themselves need more discussion. What are our goals? Uh, the Endangered Species Act doesn't say what the goals have to be, so none of these discussions require any changing of the Endangered Species Act. They just require a strategic, thoughtful discussion of how we implement it. There's no changing in the language of the act. It's just thinking more about its implementation. Goals need more discussion because of how different they are. And my final concluding point would be, because there's these different um, definitions of biodiversity and these different definitions of protect, there's the opportunity for states, federal government, and NGOs all to operate with their different definitions of protect, the different groups of organisms they, they emphasize, but to be cognizant of it, to pay attention to it, so you would know that, well, the federal government is going to do a good job picking up the wide-ranging species, the grizzly bears, the salmon. The states would pick up the more local species. Maybe the NGOs, like uh, the Conservancy, would pick up the plants because they do a very good job in the plants. So the notion here is, to turn it over to Shahid, he's going to re review what all the papers say in terms of definitions of biodiversity and definitions of success. My point is, Getting those down explicitly, agreeing on them, and knowing what we're doing with them uh, translates into very dramatic practical implications for what we would do on the ground. Thanks, and I'll turn it over to Shahid. Ah. Well, I'd like to echo everybody's. Uh uh, <clears throat> acknowledgments and, and thanks for um, uh, allowing me to come here and participate. I have to um, uh, find my um, uh, presentation. Don't you miss the days of chalk? And, uh, You're right there in that same directory. I should bring it back up. This one here? Uh, bring up see? Yeah, okay. The far right, you'll see yourself. Oh, there I am. Oh. That funny name. There we go. All right. And then F5 should do it. 
All right. Um, so I agreed to do this um, in part because uh, Peter said that we would do a Sonny and Cher act and that he would be Cher. Um, <laughs> Well, that's, that's a, you know, and I thought, well, you know, I don't look good in a daisy uh, flower shirt, but Peter would look really good in a sleek uh, sequin dress. But then BJ said we couldn't wear anything but uh, effectively blue. So, um, so now much of the, um, much of the fun has, uh, has uh, uh, disappeared, at least from the clothing aspect. But it is fun, I think. <laughs> and I think actually wearing a daisy flowered shirt would have been more appropriate for the topic I'm going to talk about, which is unabashedly um, abstract. I always feel like in Alcoholics Anonymous, supposedly you say, you know, I am an alcoholic, and of this I freely admit. I am a scientist, and of this I freely admit. Um, and um, I remember uh, back in the year, about a year ago, that Frank uh, uh, took me aside and he said, Shahid, he said, the ESA has nothing to do with science. In spite of the fact that it says it will be based on the best available science, it's because it's the right thing to do. And so then I thought, well, then why am I here? <laughs> and, um, and I don't know that I still have an answer to that question. Um, but we did, as a group, under uh, Peter Kriva's um, uh, um, guidance uh, at, <coughs> at the yurt and outside the yurt, try to consider um, the relationship of what the Endangered Species Act does with respect to the science that um, we have uh, concerning biodiversity. Um, and, um, uh, and then the, the number of papers were commissioned, and, and they're all online. And uh, Peter uh, thinks that I can summarize uh, them um, uh, very quickly. I have, I think, one slide per paper. But I know that all of you have read all the papers. So I don't. I don't really want to bore you with that. Um, besides, you'd probably all correct me, especially the authors who are here. But what I'm going to do is try to give you an overview. I think of what we mean by biodiversity and how I think if you think about the Endangered Species Act as something that represents one of the sole uh, uh, environmental um, acts or pieces of legislation that is associated in any way with biodiversity, one of the strongest ones for the last 30 years, um, that it's worth considering just exactly how it relates to this rapidly growing uh, field of biodiversity science and um, uh, lots of different environmental moves that are, are based on it. Whoops, that is not how you uh, advance. Let's see. Let's get off of this, though. There we go. Won't that shut the program up? So, uh, oh yeah, I'll just use the carriage return since I'm pinned. I like to wander around and flail my arms, but I was I was told if I did that I would be invisible on the camera, which might actually be a good thing. But um, um, this is, uh, I usually start my talks with this picture because I think when we talk about biodiversity, let's not forget, this is the image that comes to mind, albeit not for the Endangered Species Act because most of these species are not in the United States. Um, but still, it's this large collection of uh, organisms that are uh, varied in size, you know, quite splendid in their, in their behavior and their beauty and their color, and even taken out of context, as I've done here, if I just put them all in a box, um, that um, they still have a tremendous amount of meaning and, and, and value to us um, outside of the context. I'm actually going to argue, though, that this is not um, uh, where we should really be thinking about biodiversity. And I ask myself, well, there are lots of different ideas about what it is we should um, uh, conserve when we're talking about biological diversity, and how do you come uh, uh, to some sort of idea about what the best um, uh, sense of why we want to conserve biodiversity might be? And I thought, well, let's take the one for which we have the most subscribers. And of course, the convention on biological diversity, with the, with the exception, I think, of Liechtenstein, the Sultanate of Brunei, um, Iraq, uh, in the United States, um, have actually not agreed. So um, uh, we may, um, uh, we may uh, abandon this, but I do think that the notion here is that sustainable development which is what's um, you know, key for what most of the developing uh, nations are interested in, and ourselves as well. I think the U.S. is moving more towards sustainable development. I guess the, the Bren uh, building is trying to set itself as an example of how one can build uh, in, a, in a green sort of way, uh, is something that rests upon biodiversity. And, and one of the reasons that we want to maintain um, uh, biodiversity is because it is, in fact, the ecological underpinnings of the, of, of the systems that maintain our sort of life support system. And if that's, if that's true, then the only way to achieve, achieve sustainable development is to make sure that we, uh, we preserve biodiversity. So there's a tremendous international movement and uh, lots and lots of uh, different activities. Um, the, year, the International Year of Biodiversity it was held a little while ago, the Millennium Assessment, the Millennium Developmental Goals, many, many international activities that are reorganizing around this paradigm of biodiversity rather than the single species. Uh, concept. Um, interestingly, this uh, paper by, by Andy Bomford and um, a bunch of other uh, characters 
um, decided to see just how well the uh, um, uh, the Rio the, uh, con uh, convention actually was working in uh, using measurements of habitat loss or habitat change over the 10 years that the uh, Convention on Biodiversity had been around. They noticed that all of the, uh, the major sort of biomes that you could think of over the last 10 years have been declining with the exception of temperate boreal forests, which we all know has actually been increasing slightly. And if you, if you argue that loss of habitat is the primary reason, as, as um, Will Coven and others have uh, uh, pointed out for biodiversity loss, then in fact it's almost like nobody actually really did meet in, um, in, in Brazil. Um, uh, to, to discuss these issues and sign any convention. And they argued that this is, this is too bad. Of course, this was published just the week before uh, um, the Earth Summit II was held in Johannesburg to, to, to sort of provoke some discussion. But the interesting point is that they argued from a, a case study analysis that there's a 101, 100 to 1 uh, benefit to cost uh, ratio for preserving what Andy liked to call wild nature. I would like to point out that none of the other authors thought that wild nature was what we should call it because wild sounds like something that involves teeth and blood. But what he meant by wild nature was that um, we really should set aside habitats uh, intact with all of their species and all of the functions that we know uh, they carry out and that they provide services that are well worth the, the, the meager cost that it, it takes to set aside these wild, these wild lands. Um, now, so let me show you what we're dealing with here when we're talking about biodiversity, if we're to move in that direction. Again, so the, none of these are, are necessarily U.S. species. This is one of my favorite. It's SAR11, and since I have been exposed to a bewildering array of acronyms um, since I've been here uh, these last two days at dinner and at lunch and at breakfast, I'm not going to tell you what those things mean. Um, <laughs> It's my one chance to get even. Um, but this is a proteobacterium here, which is actually next to the virus, about the smallest organism in the planet. And everywhere they have looked for this creature, um, it has been found in marine samples. So they estimate that not only is it the most numerically abundant species, but also if you were to scoop it all up and weigh the collective scum, it's probably the largest species in terms of biomass on the planet. And yet this was the first photograph of it that was ever taken only a year ago. Okay, um, this is an orchid um, that a year ago was uh, uh, discovered, uh, Phragmopedium covacia, Atwood, Dahlstrom, and Fernandez in 2002. It's now gone, as the article by Carol Yoon, is a, a wonderful science writer for the New York Times, uh, will tell you. Um, but, you know, there it is. It's probably now uh, perpetuated in horticulture because there is a large group of orchid uh, uh, fans who keep these things going. But perhaps it's gone from nature and one must, you know, compare this species, which existed on one little hillside somewhere in a tropical country and is now gone compared to the other species I just showed you, which you can't even see, but is sort of almost omnipresent in marine systems. Here, the Manta uh, phasmatoidea, just to show you, here's a whole new order of insects which is discovered. I think insects are probably one of the most important groups of animals and probably one of the best studied as well in terms of its diversity. And yet here's a whole new order discovered only in 2002. This speaks to the fact that we still have a long way to go before we even know what it is we're dealing with. Um, and then this is my my favorite here, the striped rabbit, just because I really like domestic cats, and this is the closest you can ever get a rabbit to looking like a domestic cat. And it's found in the Annamite Mountains of Laos and Vietnam. What was interesting is it hadn't been seen since 1916, except a few specimens have been found in the food market, um, where I guess a, a biologist roam looking for interesting species, the best place to find them these days, I suppose. And now, uh, we have these wonderful wildlife cameras which can be set up, and so I suppose they've been seen again by these cameras in Sumatra and in Vietnam. And there's some interesting molecular biology and some interesting uh, biogeography that has come out of the, the sort of discovery that this creature, as, as, as cute and as wonderful as it is, um, is so rare that, like the bacterium, I mean, we don't see it um, because it's rare, but the bacterium we don't see because it's so small and it's omnipresent. So what I'm trying to paint for you is that, the, that biodiversity represents this enormous span of scales of creatures, big and small, omnipresent is, is terribly rare. How is it that we can say anything general that can inform the Endangered Species Act about how it might consider its role in biodiversity uh, uh, conservation or moving towards that paradigm which the world is embracing and, um, and one day as we move out of the isolationist uh, stands that the United States currently occupies, we may sign that convention as well. Um, so the way I like to do it, and this is very effective, is uh, um, I think I, I recommend you do it. I do it with this laptop here, but I don't have a screwdriver um, to do it. But here is a computer which I would offer to sale for undergraduates at a class. And 
they are really often willing to pay up to about $150. Right? I'd have it right here and I'd show it to them. And since you know, most of you, since your academics probably offer about you know, uh, $10 or $15, and probably the managers would offer three or four, because what use do they have for an outdated Apple computer? But even so, there's some value that we have to it. And then I suggest that I want a memento before I, give, before I sell this computer. I'm going to take one piece, just one piece. And in one class, I got people bidding to as much as $150 for this little Mac computer, which was sitting here with a happy face on its, um, on its screen. And then I reached in with a pair of rubber gloves and a pliers, and I pulled out a part. And we had a discussion. There are lots of little sort of resistors there. I think this is a laser beam as well, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's Don't want to blind myself. This, this one here? Yes. Okay. There are lots of these little teeny jobs here, like little you know, little brown birds, sort of all over the place. Little uh, resistors. Here's a sort of charismatic mega part component. <laughs> Here are some sort of redundant components. We all know that's a probably an important one, right? So I said I wasn't going to take that, right? And um, I then I said I'm just going to take this. I pulled one of these things out. Okay. I pulled it out with the pliers, and the little happy face came back up again. You know, little bong. You know, on the Mac, and. Do you know that the price dropped? I had one undergraduate out of about 100 who said they'd pay 10 bucks for it because I pulled out. It was working, you know, so then I went and pulled out another piece, just some other piece, and it was still, as far as we could see, as far as we could see, it was still working. And they offered zero. 100 students wouldn't pay one cent for a computer that I had pulled out two pieces of, in which they had no idea what the function was, and by all appearances, the computer was working, right? Now, this is exactly, I think, when you consider making decisions about, um, about what we're doing with our planet. I then show them a series of species which are all endangered, photograph after photograph after photograph, and I said, you know, we don't know what this does, we don't know what this does, we don't know what this does, but you are, as students and as citizens, allowing decisions to be made about what's happening to these components, right? And yet, you immediately decided the computer was worthless when a few parts were pulled out, and yet you never take that attitude about what happens when biodiversity declines. So this is the kind of um, sort of abstract uh, exercise. Now I have to go back to, oh, we'll do this. Okay. Um, so here, you know, we, I pulled out that part and I said, you know, I, well, you can go through all the different paradigms, like well, what happens if we remove redundant species, what happens if we remove these, uh, you know, charismatic mega components, and, um, and then we return back to this. Now, BioMERGE is a, is a research coordinating network which is funded by the National Science Foundation, which for the next five years will take people who study biodiversity, they do biotic inventories, work on biodiversity indices, and, and so forth, they manage collections in museums, um, and work with scientists who work at, look at ecosystem processes, things like carbon flux and nitrogen cycling and so forth, to come together to produce some sort of synthesis. And the reason we got funded to do this is because these characters were warring with one another as to who had the right handle on the science of biodiversity. Is it their role in ecosystem functioning or is it just the sheer number of species that are out there and their diversity? And we decided that for a framework that we could all sort of use for discussion, which I think is very useful, is this one here. It's pleasantly abstract. And each of these colored boxes here represents a different species. These would be predators here covered with blood in the red there. And then we have our carnivores, we have our plants and producers which are green, and then we have, of course, the system below ground or the decomposers in the sediments, perhaps in marine systems, and the water column as well, which are equally important to the community in terms of serving as food bases and also as creatures that involve the taking of inorganic stuff, you know, the sort of white powder, the phosphates, the nitrates, and the nitrites and so forth, and the invisible stuff like carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas and producing all this wonderful stuff that's, that's uh, biodiversity or biomass, which all rots and turns into scum and smelly stuff, which is called um, organic or DOM, D -O -M, dead organic matter, and then all of it cycles back and forth throughout the world uh, from, from year after year after year. And that actually is really what we're thinking about when we are thinking about all of the important components of biodiversity. Trophic structure, lots of species in various different groups, and some of the species are similar in their function while some are quite different. Put a box around it and ask how well is this system functioning or what's it doing? You could put something down here like how many kilograms of nitrogen per hectare are being fixed, but you could also ask, for example, what's the aesthetic value of the area or some other sort of ecosystem service or ecosystem process and, and then say, now what happens when you change the biota? Now, for those of you who love top predators like the snow leopard or the Florida panther or, or, um, or the sea otter, you probably 
probably already your heart was wrenched when you saw that little red square disappear from the top there. We make decisions and we are concerned about what, what the impact of a loss of biota is depending on what we think it's going to do to our entire system. Whether that's the recreational value or the hunting value or the bushmeat value or whether it's at the effect on how much primary productivity is in that habitat, all of it involves what you're going to put on this little meter here that's measuring what's going on inside. Of course, nobody mourns the loss of the nematophagus mite that's feeding on the nematodes that feeds on the bacteria, right? And yet they too are top predators which can have exactly the same sorts of effect on that bottom half of the all-important um, uh, ecosystem that we're looking at. Of course, these are the sorts of changes that, changes that can occur. You can have the entire uh, troph upper trophic level removed, such as in um, uh, Pauli's controversial ideas about fishing down the food web and marine systems. And then you can have you know, steady loss of species, primarily through habitat loss, but then secondarily through an invasions and other sorts of things that eventually yield a system that probably looks something like this, where we have you know, some species that are of interest, perhaps cattle and plants um, uh, that provide food and food for the cattle, um, and then probably some decomposers we don't think about that are necessary for maintaining the integrity of that system. Well, this is actually what we're considering here. All of these different species here, which supposedly, theoretically, with the exception of these microbes, come under the jurisdiction of the Endangered Species Act. And we understand from the, from the get-go that we cannot, uh, you know, expect every single species here to be protected, you know, especially not the nematophagus mite down here, let alone the nematodes. But certainly we have to make decisions about which of these squares we're going to be I'm um, concerned with um, uh, in saving. So this is sort of the biodiversity uh, perspective in a nutshell. So now I have to, 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 um, uh, to summarize for you so that we can have our panel discussion here what the findings were, if you will, of the various chapters that are contributed to our section on um, defining biodiversity. And so the way I've described it is it's 30 years of biodiversity dialectics or arguments or debates. And to me, the funny thing is, as a scientist, I think that is wonderful because science really is alive and well and making progress when there are debates. Unfortunately, no one seems to understand that, except that the scientists them, um, themselves. In fact, when I have a graduate student, I usually advise them not to move into any area of science where there is no debate, because they will not find a career afterwards, because that area of science is dead. There are lots and lots of debates which go on. Unfortunately, it's completely misinterpreted um, in the public. Now, it's interesting, as, as Peter mentioned, ESA predates the widespread use of the term biodiversity, but most of the papers recognize that if you read the text of the Endangered Species Act, that it is clear that it associates itself in many ways with biodiversity. And that the ESA, there's no question, serves, at least at some level, um, in helping to preserve biodiversity. And how it does that, or how it should do that, has certainly stimulated lots of discussions. Here's the list of characters. Here are their chapters. You can find them all on the, uh, on the web. A section was sort of defining biodiversity. The motivation, as Peter said, was to understand what it is we uh, protect and, and why we'd want to protect it. So I've got like one slide per paper. So I, I hope my, my um, uh, uh, fellow contributors will forgive me. Here's one one um, um, <coughs> slide from, Wa from uh, uh, Robin Waples' paper here suggesting that one of the debates that occur is whether or not we really should just be looking at the species or should we looking at, be looking at populations, individuals, and should we be looking at a landscape level when you have this sort of, this sort of a, a meta species. In this case, we're looking at salmon, which of course was one of the first cases where the evolutionary stable unit became an important item of discussion in the Endangered Species Act. Um, Brian Norton actually has a fascinating paper talking about how you define biodiversity one of the uh, favorite topics of academics is to, to talk about how you define something. He points out that one of the particular challenges we have is this dual criterion of finding a definition that fulfills the broad purposes of policy discourse, but also actually achieves biological respectability. And that actually is quite difficult um, uh, to do, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. He uh, points out that there are many definitions, but what he does, and I think he does this quite nicely, is to show that all of these different definitions of biodiversity also ultimately really do, reduced to a couple of classes, one in which we consider biodiversity primarily trying to be defined in terms of the quantity of things that are out there versus the sort of quantity of difference among the things that are out there, what we would call inventory versus difference type definitions. That to me is progress and it's something that we can use in terms of trying to decide how would we define biodiversity in terms of uh, something useful for the Endangered Species Act. Um, there are many metrics of biodiversity. Um, 
Um, uh, <clears throat> Steve Pulaski here uh, points to this interesting paper by Redford et al. in which they found that there were 21 different metrics used by 13 organizations um, that were devoted to biodiversity conservation. If there's so many definitions of biodiversity, it's not surprising that there are also lots of metrics. Well, this isn't good either. And he reviews the very, the sort of uh, various properties that have been involved in these metrics. And you know, biodiversity can be seen as a function of species richness, um, which is always seems to be an important part of it. But you want to weight those species. And you can weight them by commonness, rarity, function, their visceral characteristics. Is it something that has a large red feathery crest, you know, that we say, wow, that has to be preserved. Um, and then there's phylogenetic uniqueness as well, and debates about the phylogenetic position that um, uh, uh, deter might determine how we would weight a species in a particular biota. biota. He makes the interesting suggestion that what is needed is not a single number of, uh, a single kind of metric, but that we really need to have um, a system of accounts for biodiversity. But he points out that for this system of accounts to be effective, one of the things, and I think this would be useful for the group to discuss or uh, to consider before the publication comes out, is that in order to develop an effective system of accounts for biodiversity rather than sing single uh, all-encompassing metrics, is to understand what is our measure, what's going to be our measure of success. Okay, and he says, unfortunately, the conservation community actually speaks with many voices at this point, which is a good thing, because if they all spoke with one voice, I'd be suspicious. Um, now then, um, the, the, the paper by Calicott by, um, <coughs> on, um, on uh, uh, values of biodiversity also points to the fact that there are lots of different ideas about what sorts of values of biodiversity are important. He has this quote from Aldo Leopold, which I think is really a great one. He says, when one of these non-economic categories of biodiversity is threatened, and if we happen to love it, we invent subterfuge to give it economic importance. At the beginning of the 20th century, songbirds were supposed to be disappearing. Ornithologists jumped to the rescue with some distinctly shaky evidence to the effect that insects would eat us up. And in Minnesota, this is quite true. Um, <laughs> if birds fail to control them, okay, the evidence had to be economic in order to be valid. And of course, Aldo Leopold is arguing from the, is arguing from the standpoint of the land ethic that in fact there are many values that um, uh, would sort of um, uh, compel us to preserve biodiversity that do not necessarily need an economic position on them. Um, I think he said that, you know, he, he's talked strongly about the fact that there is recognizable and well identified and accepted intrinsic values to biodiversity. And one of the ways you can actually see that, of course, is looking at the uh, system of penalties that we invoke. I really like this table because it shows right now that taking a listed or endangered species right here is somewhere between engaging in an act of prostitution and using a mind-altering drug. Um, <laughs> and so, I'm not so sure that it needs to elevate all the way up to the level of, you know, you're going to go to the, to the electric chair because you took an endangered species. But it does suggest that we have already begun in our legislative systems, systems to consider what the intrinsic values of biodiversity are by the kinds of, and you know, maybe looking at the penal code might be some place to get a better sense of how we do this. Um, and then uh, our paper with, um, with um, uh, uh, my paper with Claire Jusseau, who actually is the, did the, the, the brunt of the work here, looked at all of the the, the various um, species that are listed and how they relate to ecosystem services. Here's just one example, net primary productivity, and we're looking at it across some very crude categorizations of, of uh, ecoregions. And here we, so we have freshwater, um, and we have uh, marine, terrestrial, and transition, which would be something like a wetland. And then we looked at where the species are actually uh, currently listed and being protected. And we would argue that maybe we might want to say that we might want to direct some more effort towards species in wetlands because they represent areas which provide for us a lot of ecosystem services and ecosystem uh, processes. So in the end, um, so I can get back to where, where I started. All of these papers will show you that we've had a very healthy and vigorous debate at this gawky stage of the uh, Endangered Species Act, which is absolutely what you'd expect. When you stop arguing with your children, it's because they've gone off to college. You know, and it's when you stop arguing with your parents, it's because you have your own children, right? And when the debate subsides, then the Endangered Species Act will be mature on its own and self-sufficient and perhaps breeding its own children of environmental legislation. I don't think we're there yet. Um, but we have species versus habitat, individual versus population versus species. What should go into our indices? You know, well, how should we define it? We have type A values and type P values, which you can find out the, the explanation of that in Collicott's paper. Um, we have temporal versus spatial components to conservation, ESA versus NGOs, and so forth. Um, a very healthy, dynamic, and active field. 
But what I would argue is when you look closely, many of these things are the dialectics by which science or which any intellectual endeavor makes progress. We pit the competing hypotheses against one another, and hopefully some synthesis emerged. It isn't like, you know, like, like uh, you know, Jesse Ventura when he was governor of uh, Minnesota. The motto was, our governor can beat your governor. Um, and um, that's, you know, there's not going to be one governor standing at the end of the, of the debate. There isn't going to be one index which is going to end at the debate. There's going to be some index which is actually going to be better by being synthetic than um, uh, championing one or another cause. And that is the synthesis we should achieve. I would argue that definitions based on difference versus definitions based on inventory probably are going to find some similarity across a large range of different types of definitions. And I often wonder, is species richness as a metric really so awful? I mean, it really gets bad mouth a lot. But in reality, I think if you randomly increase uh, species richness or you go around and look at species richness within the area, one should ask oneself, for all of the various biodiversity metrics, don't they by and large largely go up? I mean, and we don't really know. One should check and find that out. But I would argue that functional diversity probably goes up. Aesthetic value probably goes up. Many things probably go up. Maybe it levels off down here someplace when you stop counting the microbes or something like that. But I would argue that many of the habitats we're looking at today are actually in this region where the diversity has declined to very, very low levels of species richness. And so then I thought, you know, so here's the academic, right? I got all excited. We could start using multivariate methods here and consider every single debate as a single you know, sort of, sort of an axis of policy options and we could use some sort of eigenvalue and uh, a method and linear algebra and we could come up and we could send that to the policy makers, right? <laughs> And then I thought, you know, and then if we remove the axes labels, we could send it to the American naturalist. But, <laughs> and then it hit me, and I think it hit me because of the very, you know, sort of the sobering reviews I got back on our two chapters, <laughs> which, uh, and I thought, you know what, the thing is what we as scientists want to do and what people, uh, you know, the, the, the stakeholders and the managers and the policymakers want to do is we want to keep this sort of time from when the envelope is open to when it's thrown into the rubbish bin reduced to something as small as possible. And I realized that, you know, if the academic content is extremely high, like we said, we have just figured out as a scientific group sanctioned by the National Academy of Science that some manager should go out and determine whether or not the dominant value in the eigenvector of the Jacobian matrix of the community um, uh, there is negative, um, that is going to reach the bin in record time, okay, faster than a manuscript is sent back to you from an editor from Nature or Science. Um, on the other hand, that is the kind of thing that conservation biologists and scientists really love. I mean, we've got to have the science in there. We're not going to really understand what all of the, uh, uh, the complex issues are surrounding the way science uh, actually winds up being uh, implemented in policy. But I think there is some happy medium that we can reach in between the two, and I think we should aim for that intersection. So I want to end with uh, one, I think, really wonderful um, paper that just came out in Science. There's a summary. Um, and that is that nature is full of surprises, okay? And it's a paper you can read it. It just came out, I think, last week by uh, Marshall et al. in, uh, in Nature. And, and it points to this thing that on 19th of January, 1997, there was a rare freeze in Florida um, that wound up actually destroying a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of uh, agricultural produce. And so, in fact, the cost was estimated at $300 million of agricultural produce lost um, because of this freeze. And that uh, about 100,000 migrant farm, farm workers lost their jobs because there was nothing to harvest. What was interesting about, what I think is fascinating about this paper, and I think speaks to a whole as to why I think the ESA has to move towards the biodiversity paradigm, and, um, and why I think what we want to protect, as Peter was saying, is in fact something larger than just the, the, the species, is because what, they've sh what they showed in their paper is that the reason that these freezes occurred is because the wetlands were replaced by these agroecosystems. The wetlands actually were capable of creating the kind of microclimate that prevented the freezes from occurring in this region. The agroecosystems being quite simple in their structure and lacking the, the whatever the properties were that the wetlands had that kept the microclimate from crossing that freezing threshold were substituted, I think, unknowingly, not unwittingly, but unknowingly. And instead, what's ironic about this is that all this agriculture moved south to avoid the freezes. But by not integrating into the landscape with the wetlands and with all of the species and all of the ecosystem processes and services that were there, they wound up ironically hitting exactly the same sort of freezes they were trying to avoid. I think that 300 million dollars and 100,000 jobs 
is something that can speak to policymakers, can speak to voters when we talk about the importance of biodiversity in its context, not species which are set aside and protected in regions by very carefully worked out management plans, but something that is more based on biodiversity within the context of the ecosystem functions and the services that it provides. Um, and I, one of the criticisms is that we had to translate this into something that somebody actually could use, because our papers were too academically abstract, and I promise you we will try to do that with the revisions, and we'll get it on the web at some point. Anyways, thanks. main issues really are what is a species and what is recovery. And I uh, think we are at a sort of a key juncture on, on this point right now, but I'm going to have a legal and policy focus on this question uh, instead of the scientific focus. I guess the first thing I want to do is tell you, oh, you're right, this is fast. <laughs> that was a whole speech. I can sit down now, right? That is really fun. All right, I'll come back later and play with this. All right. Uh, just looking back in the history of the ESA, not a lot of delistings, about 33. And by the way, I think everybody who's spoken about delisting so far at this conference had a different number. Um, the, Bush, the latest Bush administration has delisted six species so far, so two per year over the three years they've been in office. Um, you know, what, what's the big deal? Why should we be worried about delisting? My answer is, I think that this is maybe the beginning of a big wave. Let's see if I can do this one at a time. Yes. Um, a big wave of delistings that we as a community are going to have to grapple with, or delisting proposals. Uh, and um, these statistics are ones that I put together myself. There may be some corrections needed, but uh, uh, positive 90-day findings are out right now on uh, 17 species, 15 of which, by the way, are salmonids. Another 10 species are salmonids that the NIPS itself initiated status reviews. Much of that is in response to the Alsea Valley decision, which is sent, uh, I'm not sure if we want to get into the details of it, but the, uh, the administration's uh, response to a decision that essentially said you had to put hatchery and wild fish together in the same ESU uh, has led the administration, rather than appealing that decision or saying wild fish need special attention, uh, raise, now raising question about whether we're going to protect these salmonids at all. Uh, in my view, a very worrisome message. Uh, one uh, plant species out right now, the proposal to delist. A number of species, if you look in the uh, administration's budget uh, documents uh, that they have in their sites uh, for, for moving forward in the delisting process, including obviously the gray wolf, which I've been working on in a legal case, um, but other uh, prominent species like the bald eagle. Um, and I've heard a lot of talk about the grizzly bear, uh, perhaps uh, creating a DPS in the Yellowstone area. Um, obviously some very high profile species, bald eagles, salmon, grizzlies, wolves, uh, major debate coming down I think down in the pike on whether we should be delisting these species. Well, the context I want to provide is I do think this deserves attention because it's, it, I, what I have been experiencing is an administration that seems to be hostile in general to providing ESA protection to species in need. And one stark statistic is how uh, this administration is responding to listing petitions. We have had only eight uh, listed since in the three years this administration has been in office, all of them in response to petitions or, and or court orders. Uh, pretty stark drop. If you look at the, the 33 we've had, and there's uh, two that didn't make this list I didn't bother with, uh, the main reasons for delistings over the years has been either recovery, next on the list would be uh, taxonomic revisions. Uh, so I'm going to re, uh, really focus on those two uh, general, typical rationales for delistings uh, for the rest of my talk. Obviously, uh, all of us would like to celebrate success, so I don't want to have the, the, the tenor of these remarks saying, you know, let's all uh, man the ramparts and stop these delistings. There are going to be a number of species that truly warrant uh, uh, delistings. So we've just had, for example, the robin sinkfoil, which is a, a narrow endemic plant. Uh, I I, to my knowledge and the people I've spoken to, the case probably was made for delisting. Um, but I think and that we've actually had a lot of interesting conversation on this issue today about what is the real goal here. Is the goal to get delisting so we can all have a political 
uh, pat the ESA on the back. And I would agree with the comments that seem to be the uh, majority view today, which is that's not the ultimate goal of the ESA. The goal is recovery to the extent we can achieve it. And, and as I would define as long-term survival in the wild uh, being assured, Fish and Wildlife Service has defined it that way. Um, there are plenty of species out there that are what you might want to call low-hanging fruit that we can all work together on achieving recovery and getting them off the list. Uh, and I do think that is a worthwhile goal. Uh, but I also think this is a process that is potentially subject to a lot of uh, political manipulation, which is why I think lawyers get involved. I'd like to get involved as a lawyer early, sort of give you the heads up early. How can we avoid uh, some big train wrecks so we should have some good working legal principles about how we go about delisting so we can make intelligent decisions based upon some good standards and some transparent decision-making processes. Okay, let's see what I just did. Okay, I did that one. This is a little too sensitive for my... Thumb. Did that. One more. Okay, so the top two issues we have to deal with in delisting. What is recovery and what is a species? I would say these will be the central issues we'll have to face in the next couple of years on delistings. One thing you will find is that the recovery plan itself won't necessarily always be the answer to the question. Ideally, the recovery plan goals will be the sort of the black and white test, how the recovery plan goal has been met. And yet, it's not uh, historically, and particularly recently, uh, you will see delistings being approved, even though the recovery plan goals have not been met. Two recent examples are the uh, Douglas County population of the Colombian white-tailed deer and the Hoover's Willie Star. Uh, I'm not, I wouldn't argue today that you can never delist unless the recovery plan goals have, made, uh, have been met, but there should be a good scientific explanation for deviating from those goals. And, and at least uh, the, those two examples I gave you, it was uh, everybody acknowledges the goals haven't been made, but we got pretty damn close, so that's good enough. And I'm not really sure if that's a good workable standard. Um, so I would argue that these goals should be numerical and we should try to attempt to create some standardization uh, and uh, actually I'd be interested in the scientists here uh, feed, feedback on this point but whether you can use uh, some standardization across taxon within the taxon to create some regularity through the process. Uh, another key issue and this is a point that uh, Holly Dramus made um, in her paper in conservation biology in two, two thousand conservation biology in two thousand one, is we have a lot of species that um, is going to be very tough to get delisted. Even assuming you've met your goals on habitat quantity and quality and population numbers, and you've even, you've countered the threats. Uh, if you pull out the ESA safety nut, will there be anything else left there? And one of the key issues that the Section 4A factors uh, that are required to be walked through whenever you do a delisting, the same five factors you look at for listing, you have to look at for delisting, one of the key issues will be, have, uh, are there adequate regulatory mechanisms? And I would argue that after we get past those low-hanging fruit of the species that are perhaps narrow uh, endemics, perhaps you can get protected through conservation easements, uh, when you deal with the ones that have the uh, tougher nuts that are, are uh, suffering repeated insults from regulated industries that are going to be there for over the long haul, uh, it's going to be tough to get some of these species delisted. So uh, getting some focus on how to get some real uh, effective regulatory mechanisms in place at the state level or tribal level to get to delist listing will be one of the great challenges we faced. Now another issue you have to address, and actually this is a relatively new one we haven't had to deal with in the history of the ESA, both in the listing context or the delisting context until very recently. Uh, historically the analysis of whether a species should get listed or delisted was, well, is it endangered across its range or is it not? But if you look at the definition of threatened and endangered, the test is not whether you're uh, at risk of, endanger, uh, of extinction across your range, it's all or a significant portion of your range. And there are three recent court cases, dealing with the lynx, the flat-tailed uh, horned lizard, and the Queen Charlotte goshawk, uh, where the courts basically looked at the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service application of this term and said, there's nothing there. It, 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 they essentially, for significant chunks of the species range, the, the service, without any real scientific explanation, said, well, it may be imperiled at this portion of the range, but it's not significant. 
uh, that's not an issue that can be so easily blown off, uh, the courts have said. And so there's going to need to be some kind of guidance, I would argue, on this point, because it's a very complicated scientific question about what is a significant portion of the range. Right now, it's only guesswork, and I think if there is no uh, policy guidance issuing from the service and from NIMS, we're going to have a situation where the courts decide uh, a scientific question that I think is probably beyond their competence. All right. Now I'm going, can I just do down, right? Okay. Well, the important backdrop to all this is what is a species? Oh, no, I got one more slide before that. Let's go back up. Okay. Here is a major issue that we'll be dealing with in the context of the gray wolf, but it actually comes up with potentially with respect to a lot of species. The number of species that are listed at the species or subspecies level can be uh, changed into a DPS for purposes of delisting. That's what's being done right now with the gray wolf. As everybody probably knows, it was originally listed at, at the gray wolf species level and has, now has been changed to three DPSs, the east, the west, and the uh, southwest. And two out of those three are rapidly moving towards delisting. And the question is, when you break a species into DPSs, what goals should you be looking at to decide whether or not those DPSs can be delisted? The answer, I would posit, is not to say you met the goals of this newly created DPS because you can essentially create a self-fulfilling prophecy. You create new recovery goals for a newly created DPS, you can get virtually every species delisted. What happened with respect to the gray wolf and why that would be problematic? You had, uh, let me give you an example of the east, which I'm focusing on particularly right now. Uh, the success of the eastern DPS uh, uh, gray wolf population was decided because the timber wolf recovery plan goals have been met. If you look at the timber wolf recovery plan, it deals with populations in the uh, Great Lakes states. Now, never in this entire new, very significant ESA decision is there any discussion what is necessary for the overall health of the gray wolf at the species level. So, when do we get to the question of whether the Western Great Lakes population and the Northern Rockies population are adequate for recovery of the gray wolf? And that's what I am arguing. I'm not saying you should have a blanket rule against creating DPSs from subspecies and species, but before you start delisting, you need to address the question is, what is recovery at the species or subspecies level? Just in case I'm speaking past people's knowledge, when I refer to DPSs as distinct population segments, we've been referred to them as concept. There's three different uh, levels, of, uh, taxonomic levels, where you can list species. And one of them is DPSs, the other is species and subspecies. Shift now to what is a species in the context of the tough policy judgment. We've already worked through sort of what are the tough issues you're going to have to deal with and what is recovery. When you get to what is a species, the biggest challenges will be in the DPS context. The legislative history says it should be sparingly used, and frequently the administration will cite that as a basis for denying a petition to list a DPS. And it certainly was the driving force behind the 1996 DPS guidance, which says in addition to having a discrete population, that population needs to be significant. Well, my uh, argument here today is we ought to be watching carefully what's done with listings and delistings of DPS. That term significant is really malleable and has potential for creating a lot of confusion. I'm going to give you an example of that. Uh, the recent uh, decision not to list the Washington population of the western gray squirrel. Uh, the, some of the key considerations when you decide whether or not a population is significant is is it a, would it create a significant gap in the range if it was lost? Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service said it would be a serious reduction in the range. It would not be a significant gap in the range. Similarly, you should create a DPS if uh, one of the factors to look at is, is whether the genetic characteristics of this population differs markedly from the nearby populations. Fish and Wildlife Service here said, well, we have significant genetic different differentiation, but we don't have market genetic different differentiation. So. I would argue here is another area that needs uh, a work in terms of having some policy guides and some, some scientifically uh, transparent process for making these decisions. Otherwise, it's going to be a very politicized process. Getting down to my last DPS issue, I think, and I'm going to get off the stage. Um, and this is a very significant court ruling that came down just a month or so ago dealing with the cactus frigidus pygmy owl, where the court said, under the DPS policy, you may not list 
as a DPS uh, based upon this, uh, the significance of the population. If you're saying the significance is tied to the fact that it's really important to have this species represented in the U.S. The only way you can say it's significant is if, if its loss is significant to the population globally, to the species presence globally. Well, this is going to create serious problems for the many species that we have listed because of the fact that they're important to the, to the U.S. biodiversity. And you can begin to just go through a list, whether it's grizzly, uh, woodland caribou, uh, uh, let me see what else we have, marble merlets, let's list all the ones that are abundant in Canada that could potentially be delisted if this, if this ruling were filed. And then you can look in the southwest as well. This ruling does not need to be followed. It's a very uh, way, a simple way of correcting a very bad decision would be for the administration to clarify its deep policy and said, yes, it is a legitimate part of the significant analysis to protect biodiversity in the U.S. Uh, this, this decision was not based upon interpretation of the Endangered Species Act. It was based upon interpretation of the DPS policy, and that could easily be fixed. All right. I think I've gotten deep down in the weeds on policy issues here. Let's see if I can step back on some big picture measures and, and, and then leave. How we define recovery and how we define species are fundamental questions. They matter greatly because they determine whether or not we give protection to imperiled plants and animals. For many species, premature delisting would be a disaster because ESA protection is a difference between survival and extinction. And I would say we would like to have real, real recovery, but let's not make, uh, start a, a trend of delistings for delisting's sake. And thanks for hearing me out. As I understand our task, we're here to talk about biodiversity and the role that it either does play in the ESA or could play in the ESA or should play under the ESA. And to that, I, I sort of pose three questions to myself, and I think it's three questions that the whole body here should discuss because I don't think there are any clear answers. First is, and most troubling, is how do we define it? Uh, second is, what metrics can we develop to measure the successes or failures toward preserving biodiversity? And third is, how can we implement biodiversity under the present context of the ESA? I'd like to take these first out of order and sort of highlight some of the discussion items that were raised in the paper. The first issue is, what are the metrics that we use for looking at biodiversity? And I must say myself, speaking as a layperson, I found these papers very interesting and some points overwhelming on this point. But I point to uh, one of the papers by uh, uh, Professor Shaheem ne Neem, I believe, and others that looked at things such as uh, nitrogen interchange levels, uh, net primary productivity, as possible measures of looking at uh, ecosystem health and biodiversity. Um, one of the questions that was raised in this paper, and it's entitled is Endangered Species Act Preservation of Ecosystems Functioning and Ecosystem Services, is that uh, the ESA preserves biodiversity, though not necessarily uh, its intent. Uh, the way it preserves biodiversity in its very simplistic form is not allowing species to go extinct. Um, I think we all can agree to that point, but the question is, is that the best tool? And a question I pose back to the author and the group is, can we say that the ESA protects biodiversity or does the act merely as assist in the future potential bi bi biodiversity by staving off extinction of the species? The author goes on to say that what the ESA, what biodiversity rather, needs to develop is an understanding of, of ecoregions. And maybe even the act itself would benefit from an approach that looks at the eco-region level rather than the species level. Um, however, uh, as much as the case in many issues under the ESA, the data in that field is not, is not easily readily apparent that we can simply evaluate uh, ecosystems based on biodiversity. Um, the second paper also by the same author uh, is entitled, wait a second here. A theoretical review of what it means to preserve nature and natural processes. Uh, under here, the author concludes that, that the ESA serves a critical role in protecting the ecological and evolutionary processes, but the Act would do a better job if it could focus on preserving the roles species play in natural processes rather than the, just the species themselves. 
And I, I think that's sort of a challenge as we discuss the issue of biodiversity and what role it plays under the ESA is in a policy form if we can look beyond simply the species protection to looking at the role that the species play within those ecosystems. And I think that is a, uh, in some cases, a quantum leap from how the act is currently implemented. And it would be, I think, a very interesting and rigorous debate if we were to follow that approach. Um, in this paper, uh, Professor Neem illustrates the point, I think, very well with a, uh, with a description of uh, two die games, looking at uh, the processes of which um, uh, uh, the act protects species or could protect species. And I'd just like to maybe take some parts out of this. It says, the significance of the ESA in light of the above consideration of biodiversity is easily seen if we consider an imaginary game based on the uh, contemporary patterns of extinction. Imagine a grid in which each square is black but carries a multitude of colored pieces in each square. Each square is different. Some, like the tropical regions, carry many different colored pieces, in this case species, but few of each color, while others, like Arctic tundra areas, may carry many species, but only a few colors. Now imagine a game set in motion that we throw a die once in each square. This die plays a role of extinction. The die has many faces as there are colored pieces. And when the die is thrown, each square loses whatever piece is shown on the die. If the die comes up in a color that is not on the square, then no species is removed from the square. The only other rule is that if the colored piece is the last piece of that color on the board, the ESA is invoked, such that the persistence of that color is guaranteed somewhere on the board. And I believe that's a, a fairly simplistic but somewhat accurate model of the current system we're operating under, where it is crisis intervention. We are protecting species somewhere within, uh, within biodiversity, but not necessarily within the role that it plays. He offers a second solution. An alternative game would be that each square retains at least one piece of each color it originally had. It does not matter if the color, in this case the species on the board, is elsewhere. It is not allowed to go extinct in, the, in its very square. Thus, each square, could be interpreted on a county level, must conserve whatever species is endangered in its habitat, even if it is not endangered anywhere else on the board, in this case the country. This, I think, is an alternative view of how to protect biodiversity, where the emphasis is on the eco-regions or ecosystems themselves. That, I would say, is a very different model than what we currently employ under the ESA, and one that has, I think, very distinct policy implications. Um, the second question I want to get at is just that, which is, how can we implement biodiversity preservation in the current system? Can it be done under the ESA in its current system? Uh, I'd like to tell you I have an answer here. I really don't. I do have questions, though, which is, for one, if we take the second model of how we should view protection of biodiversity, where it should be preserved in place, uh, where all pieces are represented so far on the, on the metaphorical board, how do we currently implement the act as we know it? For example, critical habitat. Here in Southern California, uh, there is about, I think, 26 species out of 240 that have critical habitat listed, but that critical habitat itself equals maybe 30 percent of the state's land mass. Essentially, anywhere, somewhere in Southern California, you are finding yourself within critical habitat, which has very real regulatory and statutory obligations placed upon it. If we were to operate in a biodiversity level where each piece is represented within its current system, does that not require a new regulatory regime to address that? That's an open question that I have. Uh, the final point I wanted to raise is how do we define biodiversity? And there were two authors that spoke to this in our section. One, Professor Norton, and then another, uh, I believe it's Professor Calicut. Uh, here, they look at the definition of biodiversity. I'm sorry, uh, Professor Norton looks at, at the definition of biodiversity. Uh, the second paper by Mr. Calicat looks at how we, what the intrinsic value of species is under the Act. Um, Professor Norton's paper, if I can surmise it, and I know he's in the audience, so he can speak later if I uh, misstep. Um, develop, he calls for a development of biodiversity that can be used both in the public policy arena and is true to uh, ecological needs. 
However, he does call for a definition of biodiversity that is not sort of imprisoned in the current ideological debate. However, Calicut responds that um, currently the ESA suggests many ways that we value species. Um, however, there is increasing pressure to value species on an economic basis. And there should be some recognition that at some point, protecting, or sorry, uh, evaluating species on their economic basis is impossible if not unfair. Instead, he offers what's called the safe minimum standard, which is a, I guess, a variation of an economic principle that's based on the presumption that um, uh, projects proposing to interfere or damage a species must demonstrate uh, the opportunity cost of protecting the species, in this case the safe minimum standard, uh, is greater than the uh, project itself. I, I, I know I misstated that, but the point of this is uh, that Mr. Calicut appears to be looking at a definition of biodiversity that is based uh, very largely on the intrinsic value of species. While Mr. Norton, Professor Norton presumes that we should look at a discussion of biodiversity that sort of identifies the low-hanging fruit. Rather than defining it itself, we should look at actions that are common sense that can be employed to go toward the goal of biodiversity. Um, I think that that, ultimately, the first standard is probably the most fruitful. Um, my final question is, um, or rather, the last point I wanted to raise is, what, do we, what can we look toward to help uh, implement biodiversity if that's a goal? And to that, there was a paper in the panel discussion that talks about the role of NGOs. Thank you. Um, I think NGOs can play an important role, particularly when we talk about the 60 to 75 percent of uh, endangered species that are on private property. Um, I think uh, conservation banking, uh, conservation easements, are important tools. However, to date, and I, I point to a paper done by Environmental Defense Fund on the, entitled The Progress on the Back 40, these models have worked well in areas that are not uh, the urban wild, um, wildlife interface. Uh, they've worked well in situations where forestry practices or long-term projects can map out uh, a, a uh, a time period where their projects can resume. I, I think we've seen increasingly difficulty employing these mechanisms with current funding mechanisms on development projects, and I think that's a challenge for all of us. Um, that, that, that's it for my remarks. Thank you. We ask how the ESA is doing and what it's doing for biodiversity, we not only can talk about what it's done, but have a little vision into uh, what it's likely to do in the future. Um, in a sense, the toolbox is right in front of us, and we have to learn how to work with what's inside. Um, whether the 30-year mark is a, is a good time or not to assess uh, uh, how we've been doing uh, is, a, is an issue for discussion. Certainly at the 10-year mark, we had made very little progress. I think Bruce Babbitt also mentioned the fact that uh, at that stop we had uh, some real defining court decisions. We had only one signed HCP and a very small one at that, the one that Frank just mentioned, uh, and frankly little to uh, judge the efficacy of the act from. At the 20-year mark, certainly uh, Bruce Babbitt, uh, just coming on board, was starting to ramp up his initiatives to deal with those vexing conflicts between uh, property rights and development on uh, private land and act prohibitions. At the 30-year mark, uh, un unfortunately, although we've got a compelling set of, uh, uh, of, of numbers, 450 HCPs were mentioned earlier, slightly more than 100 conservation agreements, the bulk of those, almost 400 of those HCPs, are seven years or less old. Now, I was going to make a couple of comments about uh, uh, the, the temporal aspects of, uh, of, of the ESA in action, but they've actually been addressed by uh, other parties uh, this morning. So I, I think what I'd really like to do is grow a couple of thoughts out of Holly Doremus's observations that in, the fa that in, in fact um, the Endangered Species Act does appear to be working. Now, is it working terribly effectively or efficiently in any location? No, I can't really say that. But it's certainly working better in certain situations than it is in others. And whether the act really gets to the broader issue of taking care of biodiversity, again, 
where the act currently seems to be approaching uh, the landscape in a multiple species context, we are seeming to get uh, responses to biodiversity that are, that are quite positive. Um, whether it's serendipitous or uh, by design, biodiversity really seems to be best addressed where multiple species listings from more than one category of species occurs in a region or subregion together, out of which you get a Pima County style, um, a San Diego County, Orange County style approach. Now the categories that I suggest exist out there and that are worth noting throughout these proceedings are number one, the, the, the sort of declining generalist flagship species, the species that uh, um, um, then Senator Kemp Thorne and now Governor Kemp Thorne identified as the, the reasons for the Endangered Species Act, grizzly bears, timber wolves, um, um, uh, bald eagle. These are species with historic wide home ranges, very spare numbers. Um, management often occurs uh, uh, at the level of individual organisms. The second group is really the group uh, that, that galvanized the dialogue in the Endangered Species Act for the next uh, quarter century. And that is the relatively widespread but increasingly rare habitat specialists. It's our spotted owls, San Joaquin kit fox, California gnatcatcher, desert tortoise. Um, these are the economic conflict species. They're the ones that put uh, the, the diverse table together to discuss uh, resolution and have uh, uh, initiated the larger nationally visible dialogues about endangered species. Indeed, those species include species that occur on at least half the California landscape that's now subject to habitat conservation planning on private property, including regional uh, HCPs, as well as public lands planning processes such as the one that was described for the uh, Western Mojave. The third category of species you might call precinctory species or the narrow endemics. This is hundreds of species. It's those little things that run the world as E.O. Wilson called them. But they include Furbitch's louse ward and the Bay and Kino checker spot butterflies. These are the species that capture those unique sort of eccentric ecological communities that are scattered within the larger spraddle of uh, vegetation communities that are out there. Finally, the, the, the fourth group uh, might, un might not unfairly be called the basket case species. These are the ones that have been described earlier uh, in the day as perhaps those species that will never quite get removed from the list. But these are where a few individual organism galv organisms galvanize a, a, a much larger response on the uh, public and private landscape. <laughs> Now these three categories, these four categories of species really constitute unique challenges to, to agency staff, to affected stakeholders, and certainly to consulting scientists. Um, they almost exist under distinct endangered species acts. Their conservation comes with different economic and social costs. They differentially, they have a differential likelihood of ending up on the court docket, certainly. Um, and while there may be one Endangered Species Act, these four species groupings really force four different responses after listing in the context of reserve design and management issues, in recovery planning, which has been talked about, in critical habitat designations, and in the approaches needed from scientists who help to, gu who help to guide uh, decision making with better information. Um, with that in mind, I suggest that, that those who have, um, it would not be unfair to say, have manipulated the course of the Endangered Species Act through the citizen's petition and through the process of bringing lawsuits might be well advised to look to these four categories, the two middle categories, the spotted owl category of widespread uh, diminishing species and the collection of precinctory species that uh, uh, are so associated with our rarest habitats that combining those species in locations as targets for our conservation attention will go a very long ways to reaching out to the biodiversity we know so little about and which has been described earlier in a number of PowerPoint presentations. 
and I think it's important that when we analyze how the Act is doing, we really need to look at the Act through the lens of these four categories because it really brings some clarity to the statistics we saw this morning. The fact that, that those species that are recovering on one hand and not recovering on another hand tend to have a lot of common biologies, the two separate groups having within group common biologies, that unfortunately or fortunately, those species with the smallest current population sizes are those showing the biggest uh, proportional gains when we do this accounting for, um, uh, for species that are improving. And certainly it's worth noting that the two important middle categories, again, are those species that do show the declines from uh, habitat loss. And although species in general, about 80% of them are declining from habitat loss, those widespread habitat specialists and precinctory species show almost 100% declines from habitat loss. So I, I, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with that thought in mind, I think we all appreciate that uh, science in the Endangered Species Act goes uh, a, st a substantial way beyond the summary statistics and, and, and tables we saw this morning. Um, and, and it really goes well beyond, the, the, the scientific challenge goes well beyond the call for peer review, which has appeared in a couple of, uh, of uh, pieces of proposed legislation in Congress, and certainly goes beyond this specific administ administration's call for sound science throughout uh, uh, the activities of, uh, of the executive branch. Um, to try to keep Frank on his, on his uh, time budget here, I'd like to list just very quickly a couple of issues that I think really need to be addressed as we move into this fourth decade of Endangered Species Act implementation that, that do involve science. And that is to note that the transfer of information from scientists to agency staff that make regular, regulatory decisions are broadly failing, although we can come up with examples where, um, um, where, where science is, has been formally introduced into the process, where it's not introduced into the process formally, it informally leads to failure. Frontline agency staff is just simply not well trained or equipped to use the good available information uh, creatively. Um, I would call attention to Mark Schaefer, who's uh, a chapter in the recent very good book on population viability analysis, which suggested to uh, the readership that we could draw strong conclusions from non-listed species, the biologies of species for which we often know quite a bit. We're not creating engaging the databases that exist out there to help us with our reserve designs and management plans. Uh, certainly my observation from San Bruno Mountain is that situations where independent science and scientists have been incorporated into the planning process almost always result in better and more defensible conservation project, products and quite frankly play a substantive role in bringing the two inevitably separated sides together in a common dialogue. Um, Bruce Babbitt described the march, the, 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 the evolution of multiple species planning uh, from the early 90s when he took office. And in fact, that almost mirrored the march of science and conservation planning from Jack Ward Thomas's um, uh, interagency spotted owl scientific committee uh, convergent with uh, um, um, that issue of spotted owls that, uh, uh, that uh, Bruce Babbitt talked about. Um, the NCCP, which is mentioned a number of times here in Southern California, mentioned at this meeting, had a scientific review panel, the first uh, response uh, to the potential gnat catcher listing was the was the creation of a scientific review panel, which uh, played a uh, uh, extremely important uh, role in in bringing the visionary ideas of uh, of the Irvine Company and other forward looking landowners to uh, um, uh, to the Endangered Species Act. And certainly, we've gotten to the point now where even individual landowner HCPs, I think of the Pacific Lumber HCP 
perhaps the last entity one would have thought would have a, a, a science review panel to it has probably one of the best populated and, and uh, intellectually competent uh, science review panels that's been put together. Science in habitat conservation planning has to become de rigueur. Uh, very quickly, I think we're not doing an effective job of harvesting lessons from our planning successes and learning from our failures. Uh, what we learned from San Bruno Mountain in 1980 was effectively lost before we went to Coachella Valley a year and a half later. Uh, we seem to be reinventing, especially in new areas that have not been subject to HCPs historically. We seem to have to start over an awful lot. Um, you know, in, in California, there was there was effectively a brain trust about an ec uh, about a decade ago of lawyers, scientists, and agency staff who knew how the process works. Uh, Four hundred plus uh, HCPs later, that brain trust, that experience gets filtered out. We've got to find a way. It's going to need a national database. We need to provide a memory of where we've been and what's been learned, and we need to provide better guidance for the new HCPs that could be called uh, from the old. And finally, I think we need to develop a template for approaching the, the, the planning challenge. The agencies really have eschewed articulating guidance um, to the technical challenge of HCP and other conservation planning development. Uh, you know, every species is different, so we can't use a cookbook. But if we really want to export uh, NCCP from Orange County, there's some, there's some rules of engagement that are extremely important, clearly articulating program goals uh, linking them to recovery plans, uh, developing conceptual models that connect species to habitat and identify stressors and show flows of, of, of all aspects of interaction through the system. We, we, we need blueprints for applying good demographic and other biological information into the planning process. That can be done even though cacti are different than grizzly bears. And finally, I do think that we can articulate some very clear rules in the development of monitoring schemes. We're all over the board, and we tend not to gather data that have much staying power or predictive capacity. All those things are, 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 are uh, elements of, of uh, the Endangered Species Act into its fourth decade that we as, uh, uh, as non-agency participants can help to, uh, um, uh, to guide the uh, fish and wildlife towards. So with that, I'll close. Frank, thank you.